When you look at the bacteria that promote virtually everything we would want health-wise, and you look at what feeds those bacteria, it's not on the protein side of the equation. It's on the roots and fiber side of the equation. That's what's feeding those bacteria. Welcome to the Seam Lund Podcast. I'm your host, Seam Lund, and our guest today is Joel Green. Joel is an author of The Immunity Code and a pioneer of many ideas in the nutrition space for decades. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, formerly known as Blue Blocks. My favorite light and sea pulmonization companies, Blue Blocks, has rebranded themselves as Bond Charge. They're now involved with a huge range of evidence-based products to improve your wellness and life in every way. Their extensive range of premium wellness products helps you to sleep better, perform better, have more energy, recover faster, balance your hormones, and reduce inflammation. My favorites are their red light light bulbs because they can be used to create a melatonin-friendly environment in your bedroom by shining only red and not blue or green light waves that will reduce your sleep quality. After starting to use these red light light bulbs, I find it much easier to fall asleep and feel less awake before bed. If you want to try out these amazing products that are the cornerstones to my most optimal sleep, then head over to bondcharge.com forward slash Seam Lund and use the code Seam15 to save 15%. Joel, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Good to see you, Sim. <laughs> yeah, this is our third time doing a podcast together. And uh, yeah, the first one was like 2020, second one 2021. And uh, this is for this year, 2022. <laughs> so yeah, it's glad to have you back. Our yearly hangout. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you have so much um, amazing content. And uh, when I was, you know, browsing through Instagram, thinking about what, what we're going to talk about this time, and there was like so many posts, like every post was like uh, so interesting and very like, you know, like new or like many people don't even talk about those uh, things. So yeah, it's very like hard to think about, okay, what are we actually, uh, what's the topic of our po today's podcast? But I guess, you know, um, what we decided on that it's going to be like, you know, aging and uh, longevity. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's some, also something that you are very like uh, interested in. Um, yeah. Like what maybe like, is there anything that, um, you know, intrigues you the most about anti-aging or what was the reason why you like, you know, started to research it in the first place? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think the reason that, uh, that, I had both of my parents had very poor health. So um, my mother died of cancer, like when she was in her 60s. And then my dad got diabetes when he was in his early 50s. Mm -hmm. And he, he spent most of his life kind of overweight, and, you know, saying that, you know, I got to get in shape, I got to do something and he never did anything about it. And so I think for me that seeing both my parents like, um, really not get what they could out of life, it had a profound impact on me a profound impact and I, I at an early age decided that's never going to be me <laughs> so I think that was uh, the impetus behind the whole thing for me mm. yeah yeah like the prevention thing is for sure yeah and uh, like do you have like any I don't know many people have you know different opinions about what causes aging and uh, the like yeah. theories and things like that mm -hmm. do you have like any like grand theory of like why we age and uh, what are like the keys to um increasing longevity gut the grand unified theory <laughs> right <Yeah. laughs> the grand unified theory of aging um well the first thing to say is that uh there isn't any single single cause it's multifactorial there's a lot of things that are driving the equation um and when we look at aging and what's driving it there are sort of different ways to interpret which piece of the equation is dominating. Um, I would begin with uh, um, probably insulin at the high level, highest level, just because if you break down the, um, the signal pathways of what's going on during, so here's my grand unified theory. Um, energy uh, and growth and life are the exact same thing. They're all one thing. So that the taking in energy is essential for what we call growth. Growth can be defined in two ways. It can be defined as cell cycle progression, and then it can be defined also at the same time as um, the protein synthesis, as the manufacture and production of protein. So we can, we can define growth that way. Um, and what we find is that the production of energy and growth by that definition are one and the same. You, you cannot have um, 
you cannot have energy come into the body uh, in the form of glucose transporting across the cellular membrane and not get uh, cell division and not get protein synthesis. So, um, and then what we find with that is that when there are disorders of, or something gets broken anywhere, anywhere in that chain. So for example, in the, uh, in the, in the transport process, bringing glucose into the cell, you have a, uh, a signal chain of molecules and you know you have um uh irs1 um pik3 akt a bunch of intermediates we have these um transport um signal transport chains to bring sugar into the cell and if so energy and if anything goes wrong with any one of those you're going to see issues you're going to see pathologies and so ultimately what we can say is that the production of energy and the equation of life are the exact same thing they're one and the same and when energy goes to zero, uh, that's called death. That's called um, by a number of different things, um, but that's, that's death. So at the top of the food chain, I would say is insulin. And it's because um, in, the, in the signal pathway, insulin, the IGF-1 growth, insulin IGF-1 receptor, it activates, um, it, act it activates the growth pathways. So it activates what's called MAPK, mitogenic activated protein kinase. And that controls cell cycle um, division that controls progression through cell cycle. So that directly, directly controls lifespan because um, we only have so many cell divisions. And when we're taking in energy, we are triggering the cell cycle progression. When we stop taking in energy, i.e. fasting, i.e. autophagy, we stop cell cycle progression. Um, and then on the other side of the equation, the metabolic side, when we take in energy, um, we trigger mTOR, so we trigger protein synthesis, and then mTOR is a throttle. It either slows down or accelerates energy transport into the cell, and that's all governed by insulin. So the ability of the body to respond efficiently to insulin, to not make too little, to not make too much, uh, directly mediates um, key signal pathways that directly drive uh, using up the body over a lifespan. So I, I would say the thing that people could probably get their hands on immediately and directly affect right now today that's going to have the biggest effect long term is insulin and understanding how to um, manipulate insulin to get the maximal uh, lifespan. That's what I would say. Mm. Wow, yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. Like, uh, obviously, we know the insulin resistance and uh, diabetes and those uh, cut, yeah, many years of your life. And like in animal models then one of the like one of the main like pathways of longevity is like the insulin IGF one signaling pathway and uh yeah like you know if things grow too much through the insulin and mTOR and IGF one pathways then yeah obviously you will just you know you, you of course you can like experience this um you know malignancies and cancer growth but uh, yeah like you know too much growth is still you know harmful for the um, aging side yeah, like like if we're gonna talk about growth, you know what we have to consider in the definition of growth is protein synthesis, cell cycle progression. Okay, the the production of, of proteins, the ability to make proteins, um, all those things are in the equation. And then what gets lost in the discussion is that that's directly directly controlled via insulin and its action on the insulin IGF one receptor directly controlled. So you have, um, let's take MAPK, that pathway. Mm -hmm. So when you stimulate, when you, when insulin stimulates the in insulin receptor, you get um, basically this dropping down of the beta subunit that sits below the cell surface. And then you have this tyrosine, you have the scaffold of, of kinases, tyrosine kinases that fire. And there's a sequence of kinases. It's 972, 1064, 1065 that fire. And what that does is it, is it activates uh, cell cycle progression. So that means that cells can be in a state where they're just kind of hanging out. They're not doing much. They're not dividing. They're just, but they're not, they're not, they're in a quiescent state. And then when that pathway gets triggered by the IGF-1 receptor, by insulin, now what happens is cells have to make decisions. Ah, do we want to proceed, proceed to the next phase? Do we want to hang out? What are we going to do? And so that, that whole thing starts the clock on lifespan, you know, and that's, that's directly tied to insulin. So if we have insulin resistance, for example, and we're 
we're making, in other words, the insulin receptor has lost its ability to respond to insulin and move glucose into the cell. So now what happens is the body's making more insulin to get the same result. So the IGF-1 receptor is firing, firing more, but we're not transporting glucose, okay? But what we are doing is activating all these pathways. We're activating the MAPK pathway. Yeah. Yeah, so that's aging. <laughs> yeah, like in like if you have a high blood sugar levels or hyperglycemia, then you actually are under this chronic mTOR stimulation all the time. Like you're always growing, or body is detecting that it's growing, and at the same time, because you're not shuttling the glucose into the cells, or there's too much of it, then uh, you're at the same time like damaging, you know, or causing glycation and damaging the blood vessels, and you know, <laughs> like a double whammy from uh, both sides. Yeah, well said. Very well said. Yeah. Uh, so, like, what do you say? What do you say then? Like, you know, is the answer to be on a, like a low carb carnivore diet or uh, suppress insulin completely or what's the like, you know, solution in your opinion? Yeah, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> so uh, here's what I think the answer is. And um, I don't claim to have the answers. I'm just telling you, this is what I've come to for me. Um, and it's basically this. Um, when we look at insulin and how to make insulin work optimally, um, it's like a, it's like a lineup of the usual suspects. Okay. There's a few key players that we have to look at. Um, one set of players are what I would call the family, you know, the, the family of insulin hormones. So this is not insulin, but it's, it's other things like, um, the incretin hormones. So that would be GLP one, uh, GIP, that would be, uh, adiponectin, uh, glucagon. That's so other hormones and what these hormones do is they make insulin work better. They sensitize insulin, okay? And so we have to look at two classes of things. The first class is what I call direct stimulation of insulin. And the next is what I call indirect stimulation of insulin. And we need both, you need, you need both. So insulin, what we find when we look at it is that it works, uh, the analogy is that it works like a muscle. And the more that you work that muscle out, you, ha you have to work the muscles out in order to keep them toned. Now you don't want to like work out too much per se. Like, you know, if you're a competitive, uh, let's say you're a competitive athlete and you're training around the clock, you know, you can overtrain, you can train too much, but conversely, if you're a couch potato and you never get up and you never exercise, that's not good either. So, you know, we need some, we need exercise in the picture to keep the muscles optimal. Insulin is the same way. Like if, so if you're on a low carb diet and you're never really triggering insulin, it's going to get weak. It's going to get dull over time. Okay. And so one of the, um, things that's not well known uh, as a result of low carb diets is that they have a short term effect, a long term effect in the short term, they seem to improve insulin sensitivity, but in the long term, they make it worse. They mm -hmm. actually drive insulin resistance. So when we look at these things like a carnivore diet, <clears throat> um, it, it's very easy to say, Oh gosh, well, I, I did it for six weeks. My insulin sensitivity improved. That's the solution. But, but actually the window of observation, if we kept it up long enough, what we'd see is when we get into you know, down the road much farther that that's reversing. And, and, and there's a number of factors that are driving that. One of them would be that you're overstimulating glucagon. So when you start overstimulating glucagon, which is a starvation hormone, then eventually what's going to happen is you're going to um, suppress insulin function and you're going to, you actually can get insulin resistance from that. So all this to say that we need to stimulate insulin directly, um, but not too much directly, but not too much. The other side of the equation is that we need to have periods of remission where we don't stimulate insulin, but we stimulate the helper hormones around insulin. Okay. So here's the, the basic idea is that if we have, let's say in a given week, three days where we were kind of low carb and we didn't stimulate insulin much, what we're not doing on those days is we're not triggering IGF-1 insulin receptor. We're not stimulating the MAPK pathway. We're not really triggering protein synthesis too much. You're aging slower on those days. That's like an autophagy day, right? Mm. Then if you have another three days where you're stimulating insulin directly, that's like a growth day, okay? And you need both. You need, you need a balanced equation. Our ancestors, um, I like to actually watch survival shows, you know, like um, Naked and Afraid and Alone. I like, right. <laughs> and when you watch these shows, uh, you kind of see the same pattern. It's, it's that it doesn't matter what you think you are coming into the show. Maybe you think you're a vegan, you get on the show like three weeks and everybody's a carnivore. <laughs> and conversely, you come on the show as a carnivore, I'm never going to touch plants. 
everybody's eating plant foods when there's no meat available. Okay. So what you see is scarcity. And in these scarcity periods, people forage and they eat roots and they eat berries. Okay. This is all there is, but it's, it it doesn't satisfy them. Okay. Like what they're ultimately looking for is, is energy dense food. So game, but, but game is hard to find. And so what you find is a balance. You find a balance between sort of like starvation, autophagy, and then growth. And, and that's, that's what we should have going on. And as a result, insulin's getting stimulated. So what I would suggest um, is that you have um, a minimum of about three days a week where you're directly stimulating insulin through insulotropic foods. These are foods that are high in resistant starch, polyphenols, um, uh, key fibers, and that you introduce them on kind of a curve where you, 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 it, you treat it like working out. Like when I first started exercising, I didn't, I didn't start at the Olympic level. I started at the couch potato level and then I gradually increased my exercise. Okay. And so that when you, when you begin to introduce these into the diet, your insulin sensitivity is not going to, particularly if you've been doing low carb carnivore, your insulin sensitivity is going to suck coming off that. So you just slowly titrate these foods in and then over time, you can handle greater amounts. And so that's how I would do that. And then I would have another three days a week where I'm more focused on fasting and autophagy and the other side of the equation, which is foods that stimulate the incretins. So uh, eggs will stimulate GLP-1, walnuts will stimulate adiponectin. You know, so I'm looking at more kind of a, a low carb, higher, um, higher fat, higher protein profile on those days. And now I'm getting a balance. I'm getting both in the equation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm glad that you um you know started with like you know carbs and insulin because you know the first thing that um, most people talk about when this anti-aging longevity is like protein <laughs> and uh, they you know <laughs> that the protein is kind of the key um let's say uh macronutrient for regulating lifespan um so obviously mm-hmm. protein is also important but yeah i agree that you know insulin is still you know kind of the mm, yeah, I mean, like insulin and carbs also turn on mTOR, which is uh, the reason why they think that protein is bad. So, um, yeah. But what do you think about protein then? Like, uh, how does protein affect longevity and this uh, cycling? Yeah, so um, if I, I would first say that we're, we're in a, a phase, public-wise. The public's in a phase right now. And I'm only I'm not saying this because I've you know, been doing this here going back a long, long time. And I remember when it was the no fat phase, I remember that like every food you could buy said no fat, not an ounce of fat, no fat, you know, and then people were like, oh, it's got fat. Oh, that's good. Um, and then we came, then we came out of that. And then we came into the fats good phase. And this had, you know, healthy fats and omega fats. And now we're kind of in the high protein phase, which is like, no, protein's good. You need more protein. So um, a, a high level, what I would say is that I, I put protein kind of in the same way that I put everything else, which is uh, sort of a balanced approach to it. Um, and so pros and cons, um, the, the pros of protein is that, you know, we need adequate amounts in the diet and that's, that's a point of discussion. Um, what's the adequate amount? What's the right amount. So, um, let's start at the high level, which is, um, which is too much will kill you. Okay. So that would be rabbit starvation, salmon starvation, protein levels that are, you know, 80, 70, 80% of the diet. And, um, that's, that's been proven. Like just try that for a couple of weeks and, and you'll be dead. Okay. So that, that's, we can see that, um, if we're getting in just nothing but protein, no fats, you know, uh, you can die from that. That was a, there's an interesting paper that I read talking about the scaling of civilization and very interesting. So I talked about basically the fact that the inflection point allowing civilization to occur took place when the primary constraint, which was death by salmon starvation was eliminated. And we, then we went to agriculture. And so the, the, the nutrient constraint was the thing keeping populations down. And then as soon as we had this sort of variety, boom, you know, we saw civilization emerge. Um, but all that to say, it, it, there's an interesting thing that's not generally talked about or ever understood, which is that like, if you just had one nutrient source, like say I'm going to rabbit, you'd, you'd die eating that. And that's, that's, so that's super high protein. Um, and it would happen fast, take about two weeks to happen. Um, that being said, most of the research out there talks about high protein being 35% of the diet. Um, and very easy. Most, most people that are, you know, into being healthy these days will have protein intakes well north of that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, for a period of time, uh, I would, I would, I would say the extended, um, practice of that long-term will present problems, uh, that, that you should be aware of. 
one, one of them being insulin resistance. Um, but on the pro side, you know, we need protein, um, at, we need more at certain ages. So, um, there, there's one school of thought that is, um, in the fifties, there's more of an incidence of colon cancer. You need less protein, but then in the sixties, you need much more protein because of sarcopenia. Um, there's probably something to that. I, I would say that if you have adequate fiber in the diet, colon cancer issues, less of a thing, um, as a longevity mediator, um, insulin via carbohydrates, um, I think probably is a, is a more powerful mediator for that. Because when you look at like proteins effect on, you know, insulin and mTOR, it's just generally not going to be as much as carbohydrates. So like the big bullet in the gun is carbs, but then, you know, we have to take protein into account too. Um, protein can be very useful, um, calorically, um, protein calories just don't seem to affect, uh, body or uh, weight, body fat in the way that other types of calories do. So I think it's very useful, you know, in that sense as a, as a, like, if we're going to increase one versus the other, what's the thing that we're going to increase. Interestingly though, um, there's some really good research on this. The, the most important nutrient that's missing in the human diet today is not protein. It's resistant starch. And there's, there's some new research coming out that's looked at, um, paleo, um, lithic populations and it, it, it's the, the conjecture seems to be that <clears throat> they were eating roughly 30 grams a day of resistant starch. And the average person nowadays gets in one to two grams of resistant starch. And, and so like, if you're going to increase any one thing, it's the resistant starch. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. So resistant starch being this, uh, let's say a more fibrous form of uh, starch that uh, has like a better glycemic effect. Yeah. So, so mainly just, I think the easy way to think about it is, um, scarcity and availability, like digging up roots is kind of my last pick. Like that's the last thing I'm going to do, but if I'm starving, I'll do it. And so in terms of like human history or just go watch a survival show, um, it's not that we don't have refrigerators. It's not that easy to get game typically. So what you do, what, what you make do with in the meanwhile is you just forage foraging on, you know, roots and, and, and edible things that and plants and things. And those have tons of resistant starch in them because you're not cooking them. So that's the missing ingredient. We used to, during the starvation phase, we would forage and we get a lot of resistant starch and that doesn't happen anymore. Mm, gotcha. What kind of foods would we naturally get the resistant starch from? Uh, roots primarily. So roots are like your best sorts of resistant starch. Uh, so potatoes, you know, tubers, things like that. Um, those are, those are probably your best sources. Mm. And what effects, you know, um, what's the like health benefit from that, that we get? Primary benefit is, is, is that's how you keep the gut fine tuned. So when you look at, um, the bacteria that promote, um, virtually everything we would want health wise, and you look at what feeds those bacteria. Um, it's not on the protein side of the equation. It's on the, it's on the roots and fiber side of the equation. That's what's feeding those bacteria. So the, the thing to understand there is like, if you're on like say a low carb carnivore high diet, what you're doing over time is you're depleting substrate for those bacteria. Um, and that is not a, uh, a match for what we saw historically. Historically, what we saw is that uh, during periods of scarcity, you'd forage and then you'd be getting in resistance starch. So what the resistance starch did was it kept those populations high in between game. And then when you had game, you'd pick out and restore muscle. Mm. So that's the primary benefit uh, is, is those bacteria that help you stay lean and, and, and promote longevity. Mm. Yeah. And it also has this blood sugar lowering effect or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, right. Um, uh, and, uh, foods, uh, uh, you know, the green bananas are also a good source of that, right? I've seen some pictures on your Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the green banana craze. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what's interesting about that also is, um, I, so I did a post on, uh, green bananas. And that, so in my book, for those of you not familiar the immunity code, I wrote about semi green bananas. Um, <laughs> and then recently I did a post on, um, green bananas and I had, like a bunch of people from South America message me <laughs> and, and go, yeah, we've, eat, we've been eating these forever, you know? And, um, it's kind of funny because here, here in, here in the States, uh, 
you can't get people eating green bananas. It'll, they'll just, they'll bloat and they're not, they can't handle it. So you have to give them semi-grain and, and start in small amounts. Mm. Um, but, but people from different parts of the, of the world, like South America, that it's a regular part of the diet. They eat tons of this things, no problem. But yeah, so um, semi-green banana is like a really good source of um, prebiotic fiber and resistant starch. And uh, it's something I've been doing for a long, long time. I combine it with grapefruit. Um, it's a nice little, it's a fun little trick to, to play with. Um, you can take a day where you just eat a semi-green banana and grapefruit. And not everybody, but most people will report by the end of the day, like their energy is insane by doing that. And it's from combination of B vitamin production from bacteria and AMP K activation from the grapefruit. Mm, wow. That's interesting. So just yeah. how much, how many bananas would you eat then? <laughs> uh, it, you're kind of self-limiting in that. So I typically like what I'll do is two, two per meal, two to three per meal. And then I'll have four to five meals <laughs> in a day. Yeah. Yeah, I've, um, yeah, I actually like the green bananas more than the uh, yellow ones. Kind of, I don't know, they taste a little bitter. <laughs> and, uh, really? You like them more? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, like, you know, yellow bananas are sweeter, but uh, I like the starchiness or the kind of the, you know, toughness or a bit more chew. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it literally feels like paste on the tongue. Or maybe that maybe I've been eating the semi green. I don't know. Like I haven't seen the color map, but <laughs> anyway, like slightly more greener for sure. Like you know, they're very uh, tough or starchy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're an animal. <laughs> um, then uh, what I was gonna say. Um, let me think. Uh, then cook cooking and cooling the potatoes is another one, like a common trick to get the reason such. Yeah, you can cook and cool and heat and reheat. And then a lot of it also depends on the potato cultivar. So there's different types. Some potatoes have more resistant starch than others. And um, there are, um, there's something I can't talk about because it's, uh, I'm coming out with it pretty soon, but it's a type of resistant starch that um, will increase acromancia by 300%. And um, it, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I can't say anything other than that. But let's just say that uh, there's a there's a there's a lot of debate about resistant starch, and you know you'll find some people in the scientific community are like, ah, that's a big red herring. There's nothing to it. And I, I would just say that's debatable, and um, it's easy to prove to yourself. You can just you can just do it. Um, one of the best uses of resistant starch um, is is uh, uncontrollable hunger. So a really good hack for hyperphagia for uncontrollable hunger, and it works every time is so if, if you're let's say that you have hyperphagia you have like you're eating just way too much at night you're like ah, i can't stop eating what you do is in the morning in the a.m you can literally reset the body's circadian clock and you can do it in one meal basically what you do is you have like a baked potato really big one okay heat it cool it put some butter on it uh, have a couple of eggs with that maybe like six ounces of steak and then thirty thousand i use of vitamin d have that all at once and then that fermentable fiber combined with the protein and the vitamin d just knocks the hunger right out like all at once um and it, it's from the fermentable fiber uh it, it, it interacting with vitamin d in the gut and just reroutes your hunger signaling immediately and it's easy to prove so i just say go try it <laughs> so that, that was a 30k uh, i use 30,000. Mm -hmm. yeah I've, yeah a lot wow. a lot yeah and uh, the mecha mechanism is the kind of the fiber and uh the protein or yeah so what you're doing is um well, protein by itself obviously is very um, satiating, but um, the bacteria in the gut have a very big influence over hunger and cravings and eating patterns. And so what you're doing is loading kind of like a gut bomb in there that's fermentable. So it's going to ferment up more populations of bacteria that help with hunger. And at the same time, you're giving the vitamin D that the gut needs. Um, so you're kind of giving everything all at once. And uh, it's just, it, you know, again, it's biohacking. So it's a hack. Don't take my word for it. Give it a try. If it works for you, great. Yeah. <laughs> And then eat it sitting in uh, front of the sunrise. So uh, get the weather mm -hmm. from there as well. Then. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We can keep playing with this and, you know, <laughs> yeah, throw all that stuff in there. Actually, a cool way to do that actually would be um, do an ice bath first, which you're going to come out of that. It's going to trigger a hunger response, then do that, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, we can keep biohackers, right? We, we, we go nuts with this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the microbiome, uh, you mentioned that that's very important. So, uh, and we talked about the resistant starch. So what else, what kind of other like, mm, you know, acromancia, you mentioned that maybe like, how does 
those are also probably like very important for longevity then. Yeah. So the interesting thing with that, um, that I would point out is there's a, there's a few ways to feed acromancia. One is through certain polyphenols, but the other is through fasting. Fasting really feeds acromancia quite a bit. Acromancia um, prefers internally secreted proteins from protein in the diet. So this is one of the reasons why low carb, high protein over time uh, isn't that great for the gut because you're you're taking in external protein, um, external nitrogen source, suppressing um, kind of what acromancia needs. But when you're in a starved state, when you're fasting, and you're secreting nitrogen internally, acromancia feeds off that. So it feeds off the gut lining. Um, so that's good and bad. There's, there's pros and there's cons to that. So the pros to that is that acromancia turns on genes that help insulin resistance, help insulin sensitivity, helps with aging, all that. That's really good. Um, the cons with that is that um, forget the word fasting and just say, let's use the word starvation for a minute. So easily verifiable that starvation destroys the gut lining. So when you're, when you're not, when you go without food too long, you get too much acromancia. So and the reason is simple that um, if acromancia feeds on fasting, keyword starvation, if you have too much of that too long, then it overwhelms the gut lining's response to acromancia, which is a little bit of acromancia, wears down the gut lining, the gut responds, makes more acromancia. That's good. Too much, like, like you know, I, know, I know people that do this, that they just, you know, they got into fasting and it's all they're ever doing, they're always fasting. Well, you begin to wear the gut lining down over time from doing that because you have too much acromancia. So the longevity sort of like approach to it is to regularly stimulate fasting um, on a weekly basis, but don't do it too much. Uh, make sure that it's balanced in there. And, and so by doing that, you have optimal um, production of acromancia and you don't have the downside of that, which is that, you know, you're getting too much. You're trying to get the benefits of autophagy and fasting with too much of that kind of thing. So we need growth. Growth is an important side of the equation. So, mm, yeah. What do you think? What do you think about the uh, fasting side then for overall longevity? Like, um, you know, how much do you think is, and, you know, like maybe like what do you think about the extended fasting? Like uh, that's also like very mm. Uh, mm. thought to be like a very anti-aging thing to do, like, you know, five day or seven day fast. I think it's okay a couple times a year. Uh, me personally, I wouldn't do it more than that. Um, but I think a couple times a year, it's probably essential. I would probably add in some senolysis with that, like, you know, very specific things like Fizatin and, you know, other things. And I can tell you what I do on that. So I might even throw in like um, some urethromycin on that with Fizatin and, you know, an extended fast. That's really good for flushing senolysis cells. But as a practice that you're doing all the time, um, what what is part – so in my book, The Immunity Code, what I talked about is um, basically – increasing the benefits of fasting and reducing the time you have to fast. That's kind of a sweet spot. And the way you do that is through uh, mimicking foraging. So uh, if we go back and just think about it, you know, historically there wasn't always food um, or, or go watch a survival show and watch what people do. Um, when there's no game available, they have to exercise, they have to walk uh, to find food and they have to forage. And then what they're eating isn't like the first pick. Nobody's, nobody's first pick is roots. Nobody's first pick is, you know, foraging for berries, but they're eating those things. And then the net result of having those things is that you are in that autophagy state, you're stimulating the bifidobacteria, you're stimulating all the key bacteria. Well, what's interesting is when you look at what those bacteria do in respect to longevity, they exactly mimic fasting. So when you look at the pathways turned on by those bacteria, they turn on AMPK, they potentiate, you know, all this sort of like gene activity, certain, all this stuff that essentially mimics fasting. So what I advocate is having your roots fibers the day before a fast, spinning those things up, going into a short fast, and then adding in small molecules at the start of the fast. So, you know, Fizatin, things like that, berberine, and turning on all of those pathways through a little modern supplemental help, um, to really turning up the, the jets on, you know, autophagy and AMPK and CERT1 and all that stuff. Um, and, and so just as a maintenance tool, I'm not really fasting that much, but I'm maximizing signal pathway strength. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like, you know, <laughs> the goal shouldn't be to fast as long as possible. The goal is to get you know, the most benefits from the least amount of fasting. <laughs> and... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, it, you know, I mean, uh, it, it, so just again, if we just look at survival shows or historically, what you quickly see is that there's always going to be periods where, you know, you just you go a couple of days, two, three days, and you couldn't really eat much. Um, and that's 
it, but what's interesting in that is like, if you watch a survival show, what you'll see is um, they're still eating something, you know, they're just subcaloric during that period. But, the, and, and, and so as a result, there was really hungry. Um, so that's always going to happen. And I think it's good to mimic that kind of thing a couple of times a year. Um, I'm not like uh I'm not a, I'm not a proponent of like what we see a lot of nowadays, which is, you know, the five, seven day fast and doing that once a month. I'm not a proponent of that because that's starvation. Starvation uh, is unhealthy. It's not a healthy thing. Starvation is not something that um, builds optimal health over time. Some is good, but too much is bad. Yeah. 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 Like you need, you need to mimic starvation. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. Like, and in some sense, you know, you can do it with exercise as well. Like you, uh, you, you can mm -hmm. eat up the benefits of fast or heat up benefits of autology and things of like that, or the activation of this AMPK and other pathways with exercise. So if you do like a very like a you know long cardio session at the beginning of a fast, then you're pretty much you know halfway through it. If you were to do nothing at all, uh, like just you know drinking water and uh, not exercising. Yeah. Well, again, well said. Mm. Um, but exercise then. What's your like uh, you know exercise protocol for longevity? Well, the main thing is um, that you're doing something every day um, and it, it really doesn't have to be much, um, but I think the two keys are um, daily and then within each day is frequency. So um, the, the key thing I've noticed as I've gotten older is all of the things you would expect to happen start happening. So your hormones start dropping, your circulation's not quite as good as it was. You know, And so what you have to do is you have to up the ante on certain things. And the most important things uh, have to do with circulation um, because <clears throat> without the ability to get uh, oxygen and nutrients to the tissues, you fall off a cliff, uh, inflammation skyrockets and all that. So what I do a lot of during the day is, um, is very much like either circulation centric or mobility centric. Um, it just, and it's, I, I don't, I don't like, you know, go have some dedicated exercise session. I just, I'll be working and I'll get up and I'll crab walk, you know, across a room or I'll just, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go do a couple sprints or, you know, I'll, I'll stretch, but so I'm doing it every day, every single day. Cause what you find as you get older is that, um, <laughs> it's all or nothing. Like if you do it every day, you can keep the body profiling fairly young you know it's like ah, i feel like i feel like i'm in my 30s this is great but if you let one week go you age 90 years in one week <laughs> yes. so you have to do it every day is what i found mm. yeah and uh, what does your like routine look like well yeah. number one thing is number one thing is sprints this is the number one thing um so sprinting is the foundation of athleticism the ability to run is the foundation of everything that, that you call young. Like if you look at old people and you go, what's the difference between this guy and, and, and this kid over here? It's this guy can't run. <laughs> okay. And the kid, you know, he hears a firecracker go off and he's running a hundred miles an hour. So, um, it's the ability to run and running is the foundation of everything. It's the foundation of athleticism. It's the foundation of mobility. It's the foundation of, uh, keeping the body young. Most importantly, what I found as you get older is it's the foundation of energy. Like you take, you take anybody who's having energy issues and you give them about 90 days to work up where they can run. Um, and then your, the cure for lack of energy at any given time is just go do a couple sprints and, and you get done. And, and so the benefit of that is, when you see people take up running, um, what hindsight has taught me is don't take up distance running. That's, <laughs> I, I, I know people who've done that and they have a great three, four years. And then 10 years later, they don't run at all because they've blown their knees out. Mm -hmm. So you want to maximize benefits, minimize wear and tear and sprinting is the way to do that. Um, so, so like basically if energy is low, go do a couple sprints bam, immediate mitochondrial induction, immediate energy production. Imme you go from like feeling like I have no energy to like, I feel great. Wow. So sprinting, I would say is the number one thing. It's, it's the thing that you have to condition your body to do and then keep in fine tune. And you don't even have to be able to like sprint like, like an Olympic sprinter. It's just more whatever your, your optimal is for you that you could go roughly 65, 70% of your max. And, and you can kind of do that on a daily basis. You're going to keep your body, your energy very high. You're going to keep, um, you're, you're going to, you're going to keep your mobility high, your flexibility high, your energy high, all the things you lose with age, mobility, flexibility, energy, sprinting will keep that in place. So, so keeping the body in a fine tune where it can sprint I, to me, that's the number one thing. Mm. Yeah. And you know, with age, you actually see that the, 
fast twitch muscle fibers decrease, whereas the slow twitch mm. uh, don't. So like, yeah, you don't lose the cardio, uh, or you lose like your VO two max with the age, but you don't lose like the fast uh, slow twitch muscle fibers. Whereas you do lose the power and the speed uh, from the fast twitch uh, muscle fibers. Yes, gosh, I'm glad you brought that up. That is such a critical point. That's um, that's the thing that we're losing as we're getting older. We're losing the glycolytic fibers. We're losing the type two A muscle fibers. Um, we're losing those. Now, type two B are kind of in the middle. They, they they can do ox loss. They can do glycolytic energy. But really, your your the muscles of youth, the muscles that were sprint centric, you're losing those. So there's some really great uh, research that uh, is recent that's bubbled up on this that shows you can restore that kind of muscle. You can actually preserve and restore the type 2A fibers just through, just through sprint training or not even sprint training, just explosive movements. And, um, and, you, and they don't even have to be like the kind that are, uh, you know, injure, injury provoking. They, they just, just little things that you can do. Um, so if you, for your viewers who are watching this, if you go to my Instagram, real Joel green, um, I have a platform and there's uh, actually fast twitch movements you can do just, it's free, just go in there and do it. But, um, yeah, that's, that's, so if we're talking about aging, well, you know, historically, like, uh, what you, what you've seen in the biohacking spheres, it's all like, well, AMK, NAD, uh, but the thing that's been neglected is the type two muscle fibers the, because when you lose those with age, um, that kind of sinks the ship. You can make a really good argument. It sinks the entire ship because number one, um, you lose the ability, uh, to, um, function in a young way, you know, like, 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 you, you know, you get injured easily, all, all these things happen, but also just from a, uh, a muscle maintenance point of view, it's, it's really the beginning of muscle decline. You start, you start seeing the muscles wither and decline when you lose the type two. So that's critical. Mm. And one way to do or maintain it is to do the sprints. Um, how, 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 like you mentioned 60 or 70% is enough. Uh, you don't need to go like a hundred percent all out. Yeah. Um, uh, so the thing with sprinting is it's your um, it's your biggest bang for the buck return because it's endemic to survival. Like all mammals, for the most part, the ones that the ones that are here today are the ones that historically sprinted well. Okay, <laughs> like either you sprinted well and caught something, or you sprinted well and got away from being caught. One of the two. I mean, that's kind of it. So um, it's it's endemic to survival. So it has the most return for the body for the least effort invested. But the biggest problem is um, it's also the easiest way to get injured. And so that's the thing that um, that's the thing you have to dance around a little bit as you're aging. Um, I've had um, literally thousands of people um, reintroduce sprinting into the body. But what you have to understand is that it's going to take you roughly three months and that it, we're, we're not looking to replicate, um, you know, Usain Bolt. We're not looking to do that. What we're looking to do is number one, how your body feels on any given day will dictate what you do. And then you, you never are looking to, you're never looking to, um, I guess the best way to put it is you're always looking to stay relaxed. What you see a lot of people do when they sprint is they tighten up and they get real tight, like, trying real hard. Um, you're going to get hurt. Mm. <laughs> the most important thing is that your cheeks should be bouncing. You should see this bouncing in the cheeks. And the, so what you see a lot of people do when they're sprinting is they lock, they lock the elbows in place. They do this. Okay. Mm. So rig rigidity and injury go together. So what you see is when you can relax and there's a fluidity to what you're doing. So like the elbow decouples from the upper arm and it flows. Okay. Instead of, instead of doing this, you're doing this and the wrist is relaxed. When you keep the body relaxed, you're only looking to approach whatever your relaxational um, sort of tension is. So as you're sprinting, as long as I can stay relaxed and I feel good, that's where I should be today. Okay. Now some days, um, the body's just on, like it's just on and I can just really go. And other days I am just tight as all get out and I'm not going to push myself. I'm just, I'm staying relaxed. That's the most important thing because, um, you'll get hurt. And when you get hurt, you have time off. And so the key is, is number one thing is relaxation. In fact, there's a, there's a book, very old book that you could look up. It was written by a guy named Bud Winner and he was, uh, the head coach at a college, uh, San Jose state. 
And he wrote a book called Relax and Win. And basically, long story short, he looked at all the successful track and field athletes and found that all the best ones were just relaxed. They were, they were relaxed, uh, but under tension. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's kind of a trick is learning to exert yourself, but in a relaxed state, not tighten up, not like, you know, lock your elbows, you know, and all that. Mm -hmm. So if you can stay relaxed and then take time, take about three months, work yourself into it. Um, nothing, nothing will drive your energy more than that. I say that from having done it for a long, long time. When my energy is down, I get up and I go for a sprint. I feel fantastic. And um, it, the mental, the mental uh, thing is 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 amazing. Um, my friend Mark Bell, uh, you're familiar with Mark Bell Power Project. Um, by the way, have you ever been on his show? Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, I think maybe two years ago. Okay. Oh, we got to get you back on that. I got to talk to him. Let's see if we can get you on there. Um, anyways, um, so so Mark kind of saw me doing some sprints. Um, read my book, has taken up running, and now he can't stop. He's addicted to the mental high from it. Um, you can get that same mental high by sprinting, and you can get it in 30 seconds versus having to go run for 30 minutes. Um, the mental high from it, it, it's astounding. You get addicted to it. So, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the runner's high is one of the like, biggest reasons, I guess, why people run in the first place. Because I would imagine many people don't, or most people wouldn't like this uh, monotonous, um, you know, cardio thing. Uh, and the thing you mentioned about the rigidity, then, you know, when you look at like cheetahs or lions or, you know, they also are very supple and uh, super fast at the same time. So, uh, yeah, there's a truth to that. Yeah, aging is rigidity. That's what age is. Like, when, like if, if we had to draw a picture of age, it's some dude bent over, mm. walking like that, okay? Youth is supple. So if you had to draw a picture of youth, it's some little five-year-old kid bouncing off the walls and you, and you can't hurt him. You can't injure him. He's just supple. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, but what about like weightlifting? Uh, that also trains the fast switch muscle fibers. Like, where do we put that? Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, it does and it doesn't. Um, so the, the trick with... Um, the trick with weightlifting is maximally centric movement. Um, and we only have about six to seven seconds of energy in the type two, um, in, in the type two B fibers. The problem is that the type two A fibers, um, can replete so quickly that what they're doing is in between sets, they're completely repleting. So we never really get to the type two B fibers. Um, for, for the most part, most people never really touch on those. Um, now, when you look at the literature, it's like, well, you know, like um, heavy centric weightlifting is going to stimulate those those muscles. But but in practice, for most people, it, uh, they kind of do, but not totally. Um, that being said, um, weightlifting is essential. I think um, it, it's a question of how you're doing it. Um, I, I would I would offer that um, quite by accident. I'm, I'm through just as a course of my lifetime, I, I, I'm very much in line with Mike Mensner's heavy duty, you know, system, which is um, fewer sets, uh, maximal intensity, um, fewer reps, and uh, and and complete complete focus on the uh, on the downward movement. So so that's kind of in, in terms of that, what that does is it's the intensity. That, that really is the bigger part of the equation. The intensity, uh, it stimulates IGF-1, uh, stimulates a whole bunch of things. And so particularly as you get older, um, it becomes really, really important. You know, you, you have to keep the muscles stimulated. So, but, but I also think that along with that, you need um, explosive fast twitch movements that you can work into what you do where you don't get hurt, okay? And so nothing trains the muscles quite like moving them quickly. Moving the muscles fast trains them fast. And what I've seen, um, I've seen a lot of people that I knew from my track and field days that were sprinters and they got into bodybuilding and they, they kind of, um, they kind of destroyed their ability to run really fast. Um, that's just my observation. I'm open to being wrong in that. Maybe there's some science study that will prove that wrong someday, but that's just what I've observed. So I, th I think that you always have to train the fast twitch muscles through fast twitch movements, through moving them quickly. Um, one of the things I like to do that I think is something safe that anybody can do is to use, um, use like a BOSU ball or reflex balls. And you can train the legs and the arms very fast by doing that, just by getting recoil. So you add recoil into what you're doing. It's just just by taking a fast switch movement, slamming it into a BOSU ball, getting the recoil, 
slamming it. And by doing that, you can train, you know, fast switch and it's, and you're not going to get hurt. So I like to do those as well. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah, like, um, uh, with, yeah, like with, um, uh, with the weightlifting or bodybuilding types of training, then yeah, you can like, you know, wear down the muscles or you tend to like, you know, start to grind the reps or if you, if you are going for like, you know, failure, uh, from a hypertrophy side, then, you know, inevitably you will slow down the uh, speed because it's, you know, you're starting to fatigue and uh, that's where, that's where you're not training the fast twitch muscles. So in like the, some sense, like the Olympic weightlifting would be probably the best if you want to train the fast of going for like just snatches and uh, clean and jerks and stuff. Yeah. Funny you say that. Uh, that's what I started doing. Um, I, w when I first started weightlifting, it was um, uh, ninth grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, um, like in a gym, not at home. And I just did clean and jerks. I, I just did clean and jerks. Like I'd go every night and just do clean and jerks for like two hours. And uh, um, I, yeah, I found that was that type of movement is you also brought up something else. I think that's really important. Um, and that has to do with the accumulated wear and tear on the muscles from weight training. So uh, early on when I was in my twenties, you know, I was, I was kind of into, you know, heavy sets and reps and all that stuff. And I, I just kind of quickly noticed that, okay, I'm going to wear the, I'm going to wear the muscles out if I keep this up. So I, I, in my approach, particularly as I got over 40, you know, I was I very much, I, I don't do a ton of sets. I might do three sets for a given body part, you know, but it, and it lower reps. Mm -hmm. So the overall, the overall volume of work, um, isn't that much. And I, and I've probably lost a lot of size, you know, as well, I could be, I could probably be like 20% bigger in terms of bodybuilding standards if I just added more volume, but it's not worth it to me because, um, the wear and tear, uh, is, um, you know, you're, you're going to drive adhesions with the fascia. You're going to get more of those. You're going to drive all kinds of things over time that use the muscles up. And so I think it's, I think if we're going to talk about aging, well, it's very, very important to consider the long term and wear and tear on the muscles. And so like I'm 57 and what I can tell you right now is that, um, that probably seems like to many people in your audience, that probably seems like way down the road, but I'll tell you when you get here, uh, if you take care of yourself, you're going to feel incredibly young and you're going to want to train. You're going to want to go to the gym and you're going to want to get results. And if you've used the muscles up, you can't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like if you take steroids, it doesn't matter. Ronnie Coleman is the world's best example of this. Like, um, mm -hmm. Ronnie Coleman, no one's ever put muscle on like Ronnie. Right. But he used the body up. He used it up. He used his stem cells up and now he's my age. We're exact same age. And it's his body's used up. You know, I, and that's something to really think about nothing. And I love Ronnie Coleman. I mean, I, I you know, he's, he's a hero of mine, but I, but just in terms of like how I want to use my body, uh, you got to play for the long term, is what I would say. Yeah. 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 That's a good example for sure. And unfortunate one in, in many ways. And it's like, if you put more effort in terms of that, it doesn't mean that you're getting more results. So, like, my one of the mottos that I like to follow is that like stimulate, don't annihilate. So, you can stimulate muscle growth, uh, like power and hypertrophy even with even like minimal effort or you know without completely annihilating the muscle you need to just you know signal the body that it you know needs to create these adaptations but you don't need to yeah uh <laughs> drag yourself through the dirt or whatever like puke or uh, spit blood or whatever that kind of thing that needs to be a t-shirt I, I think okay like i'm gonna geek out on on marketing here for a minute i, I think you should come out with a t-shirt that's stim s-t-i-i-m you late not annihilate that would be a great gym tank top to wear yeah, yeah. <laughs> you should you should have a um or uh simulate <laughs> yeah. how could you mix your you got to mix your name into stim i think that would be uh <laughs> s-t-i-i-m stimulate not a that's a great saying i like that yeah um uh, but yeah uh, but from the bone density side weight oh yeah kind of number one so um how do you factor yeah. that so yeah, that's a very, well, like, like I said, weightlifting needs to be in the picture. It, it has to be in the picture. It's just a question of um, how fast you're going to use up your tires, so to speak. So like, I like to license, liken the muscles to tires. Um, like when you buy a set of tires on a car, you kind of know that they've got a, a, a there's a life cycle to the tread. And if you're going to um, be doing, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, burnouts and, you know, hard cornering and drifting, and go into the track, you're, you're probably going to go through a set of tires pretty quick. So versus if you're just, you know, kind of, uh, driving a car, um, 
normally every now and then you jump on the engine. It's good. It's good for the car. It's good for the everything in the car. So it's just a question of like how much and when. That's that's the only thing. Everybody's got their preference. Everybody's got like what they want to do. Some people, you know, just they don't care. They want to put on as much muscle as they can and look a certain way. Great. Good for you. Go ahead. Knock yourself out. Um, other people um, like yourself are more sort of thinking about the long term. And so the question everybody has to ask themselves is um, how fast do I want to use the muscles up? That's the main question. And weightlifting is absolutely essential part of the picture. You just have to look at the, you know, like a, a lot of the extremes that are presented to us. Um, not everybody can handle those extremes. Um, I think a good, so I, um, Michael Hearn would probably be a good example of like, you know, someone who lives in the gym, um, lives in the gym, but not everybody could do that. Not everybody has the physical capability of training that much, you know? And so trying to emulate something like that, you're, you're just, like you said you're, you're annihilating you're not stimulating mm, yeah that's true yeah i mean it's you know depends on some part of yeah like goals or um, genetics and uh, lifestyle but uh, yeah obviously in, i think yeah everyone's uh, they should still do something uh, some weight bearing exercise for sure Hundred percent, yeah. And deadlifts, top of the list. You got to every everybody's got to do some kind of deadlift, like on a, you know. So the ultimate is, um, uh, in a fasted state in the morning, do some deadlifts, do some sprints. That's kind of like top of the food chain, and then everything else, you know, work in the beach muscles as you want to go. Mm, yeah, and uh, with that, you also activate more autophagy than the fasting for like three days. <laughs> if you do it, great like, point. Yeah, uh, great point. Awesome. Uh, maybe. Do you, how much time do you have left, by the way? Whatever you. Yeah. I've got. Uh, I have a. I have a call in an hour, but I'm good for now, right now. An hour. Uh, oh no! I've, yeah, I've I've got a call at noon, my time, one hour from now. But otherwise, if you want to go a little bit longer, okay. we're good. Yeah. Well, I'm not gonna go for an hour, but yeah, maybe like you know, fifteen minutes. So, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, what about supplements? So those are also you know quite hyped about the longevity. So what do we think are maybe some of them? Let's say basic and most like effective ones for longevity people can take and uh, well some other ones like more you know, cutting edge mm, I, I would say probably um in light of some new research a foundational one is nac and glycine so um the combination of n-acetylcysteine and glycine i'm sure you're familiar um has been shown to affect uh reverse aging reverse a number of aging parameters um and the two are better together than either is alone and they're very complementary so they're both rate limiters in glutathione synthesis but above and beyond that they seem to have this sort of plethora of effects on parameters of aging and so there's really good research with humans that's shown like uh you know you take small people you put them on nac and glycine and and like literally within three months uh you can measure all the markers of aging that are decreased. So um, the way that I do it is the thing you have to remember about NAC is that it inhibits nitric oxide. That's the thing everybody's left out of the equation. So um, NAC will inhibit inducible nitric oxide synthase. Um, and as we get older, we need, uh, most people need more nitric oxide because their circulation is winding down. So the trick with NAC, the way that uh, I do it, the way that I, I have a, actually have a uh, I'll, I'll admit my bias here. I came out with a product called Young Body, <laughs> which at, is NAC glycine. But um, I did it because um, I was doing it anyway for myself. I was taking, you know, NAC and glycine. I've been doing that for a long, long time. Um, but the way to do it is as important as what it is. And the way to do it is really, um, I, I advocate doing it three days a week during autophagy. Uh, doing it during a fast. And so that way it's kind of optimal because you're repleting glutathione. You're, you're, you're helping glutathione down that road during a fast, repleting it, and you're getting all these sort of anti-aging benefits. Um, and then the other three days a week, um, looking at uh, stimulating nitric oxide, looking at growth and looking at the other side of the equation. So that way you're not getting too much of either. Um, not talked about too much is reductive stress and that's the excess of antioxidants and so you have all these supplement companies talking about our product and our antioxidants the best thing a daily dose of this you don't want antioxidants daily that's you don't want that because you're going to suppress the critical um, nitric oxide signaling that we need so kind of balancing that out in terms of like when to take it that's kind of the thing so nac glycine in the morning fasted three days a week probably uh, like a, a, a that, that's top of my list. And then the other three days a week, you know, maybe things that stimulate nitric oxide, beetroot, um, things like that. Mm. Uh, does glycine alone suppress uh, nitric oxide? 
So, well, glycine by itself, um, you don't have to uh, worry so much about the nitric oxide piece of the equation. So glycine is a glutathione precursor and it's, it helps with a lot of different things. Um, but it's really NAC and it's inhibition of inducible nitric oxide synthase that becomes kind of like the, the thing with it. That's not a bad thing per se. Uh, it's not a bad thing. It's just when are you going to take it and how much you're going to take and all that factors in. And, and so if we're looking at aging optimally, um, do we want to take it every day? Probably not. Mm. Probably not. But, but, but does it have a place? Yeah, for sure. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, so my wife is, uh, she has like uh, migraines, uh, like genetic ones and uh, nitric oxide is one of the like <laughs> trigger, one of the biggest triggers uh, yeah. for getting that. And uh, yeah, just, you know, interesting. So yeah, like you said, you don't always want to, uh have like a bunch of nitric oxide and a bunch of like you know this um let's say blood flow or this uh, grow angiogenesis you don't want to have like a bunch of uh, growth of new blood vessels all the time and you don't want to have like a bunch of uh, this uh, nitric oxide all the time either so it's uh <laughs> yeah like a very context dependent yeah what you see a lot of um is so if it, so that pairs up with gut issues typically like what you'll see is if someone has a gut issue and they're getting lipopolysaccharide perfusing into the serum. Uh, so what night, what, what lipopolysaccharide will do is exponentially, um, increase nitric oxide uh, to the point where you're getting conversion into peroxynitrate. And so it's really the peroxynitrate mediated by lipopolysaccharide that, um, becomes a big deal. So, um, you know, what, what, what's, what you can see a lot of is people who are super inflamed. And the reason they're inflamed is the gut is opened up and they're getting like polysaccharide leakage and they're getting too much nitric oxide and they're getting too much peroxynitrate. So you seal the gut first, you know, and then you start to look at other things that you can do. But um, the, uh, the gut and uh, issues with nitric oxide can go together very much. Mm, gotcha. Um what are the other supplements besides these ones? Um, I think that um, uh, NAD supplements um, are, you know, in the picture. So I, I take NMN. Um, what I found with NAD supplements is that um, they work very well if you're deficient in NAD. You'll feel it. Like you'll take NMN, take it sublingually, for example, and you feel very energized. But that your NAD levels top off, and when they're when they're sort of optimally topped off, you don't feel anything from it. So um, you can make a case that um, that those things have like kind of their have their place. Um, and there's different ways to stimulate NAD. You know, like you can you can have uh, you can stimulate um, you can suppress CD38 by apigenin, and you'll get as much increase in NAD as you would from taking NAD supplements. You know, or just or just like uh, a supplement to help you sleep better, you'll you'll get just as much NAD as you would from taking NAD supplements. So, yeah, but NAD is definitely an important part of the equation. Um, I, uh, I I cycle a lot of things, so I'm never really on you know the same thing all the time. Um, other than other than glycine NAC, that's kind of in the picture on a regular basis. Um, things that I do cycle in a lot, though, um, I will. Um, depending on the time of the year, um, I will really up my testosterone regimen. Um, oh, it also for me, full disclosure on that. Um, I'm going to be going on TRT later in the year. So I, I made it to, I decided this year I was going to, I was going to go on TRT and I made it this far, which is late fifties, which is great. Um, uh, but I'm finally making that transition here. I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to. Okay. Nice. <laughs> Wait a yeah. long time for that. Then. Yeah. Long time. Yeah. I think it's, I, well, so just, uh, for anybody who cares, um, what I would offer with that is that, um, the sex hormones are critical to aging well, and you really don't want that drop off in the sex hormones because, um, you're, you're essentially telling the body that you're not useful to the herd anymore. And we need to get rid of you to make re resources available for all of the reproductively viable you know, people. Um, so it's very important to keep the sex hormones flowing. The question is, um, when, when do you pull the trigger? And what I found is that, um, 
where you're really going to need it is right around my age uh, and right around early 60s. So what you'll see is there's the, there's sub, there's these dropping off periods where like the body wants to age quicker and that's where you want to counter it. And you have a life cycle of effectiveness of these things. So like they work best up front the first time you do them and, you know, early on. And then over time they don't work as well because the receptors attenuate and all this stuff. And then you need more and all that junk. Um, so what I found is that um, you, you want to save you want to save it for um, later on. That's what I found works for me. And so um, I'm, my body's still, oops, sorry, my body's still pretty fresh, pretty fresh right now. Um, I've never taken those things. So um, I, hopefully what I'll get is a, a really good response for a very long time at the time that I need it, which is right about this age. Um, I see a lot of people that get on TRT very early, like in like their 30s and 40s and there's no need to, there's no need. Like you should be able to stimulate testosterone. And then what you're doing is you're using up your, your life cycle of, of using that stuff. So, mm. yeah. So yeah, like, you know, when you, when the, that person would get into their sixties, then, uh, it wouldn't work as well anymore. And they would still be like a normal 60 year old who doesn't take TRT, even if they are taking TRT. Yeah. And you can see that, you can see that right now. Just go look, go look at guys that were, you know, bodybuilders and huge dudes, like in their twenties and thirties who used up you know, everything. And you look at them now in their sixties and they just look like an old dude in their sixties uh -huh. versus when you look at some dude who never did anything, never did anything. And then his late fifties, sixties, what goes on TRT or starts taking Anabar or something. And, and, and it's like, my gosh, wow. You look like freaking 25 year old. Wow. It's mm -hmm. because the body's fresh and the receptors are fresh. Yeah. Yeah. That's super interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. What else? Uh, is there something else that we uh, haven't covered that you would, would like to talk about as like, you know, very important people don't realize or need to know? Mm, yeah, I don't know. I, we covered a lot of ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we covered a ton of ground here. So I, th I think we're good. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I mean, we could talk about anything that your Instagram is full of a uh, ton of information like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a good like place to wrap it up so that we can, you know, still have uh, like another session as well in the near future. Uh, but uh, yeah, before I ask my last question, uh, where can people find you and your work? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Instagram is real Joel Green. Uh, you can go there. And then um, in my bio, uh, I got all kinds of links and stuff for my stuff. You can go look at all that junk there. Nice. We're going to put links in the show notes. And uh, my last question is, uh, you know, what's this one piece of advice or habit that you wish you had up sooner? Oh, gosh, yeah. Um, I, I wish I had understood the short term versus the long term for anything like sooner. Um, because, I, you know, I, when I was young, I just thought that you apply a protocol and it always works the same. And what I've learned over time is that you apply a protocol, works really good in the beginning, kind of so-so, and then later on actually has negatives. So um, what a lot of people will find over time is you, you you try some protocol. It worked amazing the first year or two. And now, you know, a, like a common thing I, I get a lot of DMs on right now is, is uh, people who were doing like fasting and keto and carnivore the last three, five years, and now their guts are destroyed. Their guts are wrecked, you know, and it's because of that it's because of the, the long-term effect of the thing that worked really well in the short term and doesn't work so well in the long term mm, gotcha yeah that's a good one um all right it was uh, really good to talk with you and uh learned a lot of new things and i'm sure people will also uh you know appreciate the information that we talked about and uh, yeah can't wait to talk on the next podcast cool yeah this was fun well, we'll we'll definitely uh we'll pick it up again here soon yeah all right i'll see you around all right, man. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you want to support this podcast, then check out our sponsors and leave a review on iTunes or Spotify. My name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.